The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Without any stuff. Welcome to MySQL Security, more than just the ACLs. I am Shiri Cabral. I'm a senior DBA, and the A stands for either admin or architect, depending on the day, um, at uh, Mozilla. And, uh, you know, Twitter is at Shiri, and blog is Shiri.com. So um, I want to talk a little bit about general security. When I say general security, I mean for any application you have. This is not specific to MySQL. Um, if you have any kind of software, if you have a web server, if you have um, you know, third-party software, you're going to have to do this. You, you have to patch, you have to prevent access, and you have to prevent meaningful informa information gathering. Now, when I say patch, MySQL has a new version every month. They come out with features and bug fixes and security hole uh, fixes. Now, you're, it, I'm not going to expect you guys to patch every month. I'm just going to close some of these doors because it's a little loud outside. Um, Just one of them. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I don't expect you to patch MySQL every single month. That would be a lot of work to test it and whatever. And most of the time, you know, there aren't, there aren't security fixes. But you should probably um, upgrade every 6 to 12 months. One of the benefits of this is that um, if you can take your system down for maintenance, and when I say take your system down, I mean one system at a time in a rolling upgrade kind of way, you're practicing your failovers, you're practicing for, you're having fire drills. So you're practicing for the real fire so that when something does break and you do have to fail over, you already know how to do it. You've done it 10 times during the day, so you can do it at 3 in the morning when something breaks. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's something useful. Um, preventing access. Preventing access includes things like permissions and ACLs, but it's not limited to that, and we'll talk about that more. Um, and a lot of people want to prevent information gathering. Another thing to do is prevent meaningful information gathering. At some point, you probably will be hacked, right? It happens. Looked at LinkedIn, right? If LinkedIn would have just salted their passwords, nobody would have had this problem, right? The passwords would be salted, and the, and the password breach that happened a couple days ago wouldn't have been so bad. The problem is they didn't. So if somebody broke in and, and got the passwords that were salted, that would have been information gathering, but it wouldn't have been as meaningful as being able to find their passwords. If you store passwords in the clear, right, that's very meaningful information. Right? You don't even have to uh, look at a hash table for that. So think about those kinds of things. Um, when we say prevent access, what kind of access? Network access? Who has network access to it? Now you might say, well, you know, who cares? It's, it's on the same, there's a machine on the same subnet or the whole world can see it. What's the big deal? Well, MySQL uh, runs using broadcast traffic. So when there's a TCP um, packet that comes into MySQL, it's just broadcast, which is equivalent. You probably are all sysadmins here and you know it, but it's equivalent to somebody saying, I have this query for MySQL. If you're TCP or this, this, if you're 192.168.1.1, I have a packet for you. Or if you're hostname DB1, I have a packet for you. Um, and then whoever is the right server says, oh, that's me. Let me grab that packet. Um, but you can actually sniff um, the network traffic. And I'll show you how you can use TCP dump. Um, so if you're on a machine, you need to be root to use the TCP dump, but if you're on any other machine on the network, you can actually sniff traffic, which is really useful. Um, you know, people will talk about things like firewalls and things like that, but then you start talking about getting into the cloud and you realize that, hey, you have no idea who's on your subnet because you don't control that anymore. You're in the cloud. Who can get direct database access? I think everyone here knows that you know, you don't want people to be able to directly access the database. Even if they have no username and password, they might be able to crack one, or they might just be able to send thousands and thousands of TCP connections and uh, denial of service attack you um, if they have direct database access. And due to the nature of databases, you probably don't need to have database access open to the world unless what you're providing is database service to the world. If you just have like a database-backed application or website, you don't need to open the database to the world. You just need to open the database to the application. So I would definitely suggest having you know, your application in, in a demilitarized zone and your database somewhere firewalled off. Um, the other thing about access is who has uh, access to your backups? Because your backups have all your information in it. That's the whole point, right? Is to store a copy of all your information. So where do your backups go? What's the flow of the traffic? Do you 
have a centralized backup server? Is that something the whole world can see? How does the traffic uh, flow for replication? Um, is, that, is that encrypted? And we'll talk about encrypted uh, connections a little later. So access points. Who can actually log in? We talked about network seeing traffic. Um, this URL actually, I'll I actually show you the actual uh, TCP command a little later. But if you want um, the command, it's, it's at that URL. Um, and who can log into the operating system? If you can log into the operating system, you might be able to see data or logs. You might be able to see the backups. Um, this is all really, really very important to know who, who can access this information because your logs um, have all your rights. So if you're writing somebody's password or you're writing someone's credit card information or you're writing someone's email to the database, then it's in a log somewhere. So you might say, well, they can't access the database, but they might be able to see the logs or they might be able to see the backups. They still then can steal the information. So this is that TCP dump command I was telling you about, uh, TCP dump dash L dash I ETH zero, or whatever your Ethernet port is, dash W dash, dash SRC or DST port 3306. Um, 3306 is the port MySQL runs on by default. Uh, pipe into strings. And then you can grep for select or something like that. You can see the traffic running through, and you can actually get queries. It's pretty cool. Um, now, this is on the slide called encryption, because if you don't encrypt your data, you can see this. So you, you can actually um, encrypt your data, with encrypt your connections with MySQL. Just like HTTPS, you can have a certificate, and it will encrypt your data. MySQL has the same thing. Now, the one thing about MySQL is that unlike something like a web server, you can't say, I want all traffic to be SSL enabled. You do it per client, so per username that connects. So by default, all usernames are allowed to use encrypted connections or not. Um, so you can always connect to MySQL with an encrypted connection, and it will be accepted. Um, but there are also ways you can require a user to connect only using SSL. So for example, if you are worried about, if you're in the cloud and you have replication and you're worried about somebody trying to sniff that replication traffic, you can say that the replication user is required to connect via SSL. And in fact, um, when I was a consultant, we had a company that was in the cloud and one of the things that they, uh, that they did was they had everyone who wasn't localhost, so anyone who was connecting via TCP had to connect via SSL except for their monitoring system. Um, and then, because their monitor system couldn't actually handle connecting via SSL. And then everybody else who was local to the machine, so if you're like root at localhost or something, then you were able to log in without, um, without SSL because you're not doing it over the network, so it's okay. Um, the other thing I would recommend is, you know, if, you're say, if you want to take that even further and say, well, even localhost should connect via SSL, um, I would caution you to have a user that doesn't require SSL just in case your certificates are broken. Because um, how are you going to debug that um, if you can't actually log into MySQL? Um, operating system. So what are some of the operating system security things we can talk about? Well, we can talk about um, authentication into the operating system. right? You might say, well, um, we don't give away the MySQL passwords. We put it in like a root tilde.my.cnf and have people sue, you know, sudo, sudo as root. And then they don't have to memorize the MySQL password. They just log in um, as root, but then it's only secure as the person's password. So for example, if I log in to Shiri at a host name, and then I type sudo su to become root, then I end up, um, okay. my password security, my password is only good as, as my password. Whereas if you're using some kind of um, root login or something like that, which is okay. usually, not, um, usually not recommended to log in as root, um, so you have to be careful, I guess is what I'm saying, in who you give um, permissions to because you have to think about what their authentication is as well. Uh, firewalls, I'm not going to talk too much about firewalls. Firewalls are definitely important. Um, a lot of people say, well, firewall is not a silver bullet. Sure, neither is locking your car doors in okay. a parking lot because so they can be still break the windows. In the plug -in stuff. But you still do it, right? Yes. Um, and to um, me, security and just to give is you a little very background like, on myself uh, um, with regards to FreeNAS. Is very much um, like, so the company uh, I work for is leading the Porsche, development in the 8 series. Car. 
or if you and have like an I'm Xbox the who gets to write all the documentation. That's like being the Department of Defense, so right? So I'm the person try to, hack to email if you but find stuff in the documentation. Most of us drive like Toyota Corollas, right? They're not exciting and cars. We'll find there's nothing. Stuff as we there's go no exciting electronics today, in the so back. I'll but if you leave your doors that. open, someone's going to try to steal your car. So the outline for today's course. All we have to do is make sure our doors are locked, right? So for most of us, probably a firewall. We'll just do a basic introduction on what FreeNAS is, what its features are, a little bit about the history. So you have an idea what's going on. And we'll also do an overview of the um, of the security uh, ZFS well, there's is a one lot of more you the can do with that. sort of crown so operating system files and permissions my SQL is pretty good at doing um, doing this right when you ZFS install you know MySQL, whether it's MySQL or Procona's patched version or MariaDB's version of MySQL or whatever you use um, it starts MySQL it starts a wrapper script around MySQL called MySQL D safe it starts that as root and the reason it starts it as root is so it can then spawn the MySQL D process, the MySQL daemon, as the MySQL server user, which is usually called MySQL. And it does, it spawns it from the root user so that the MySQL user inherits everything from the root user. Things like U limits for files, uh, for open files and things like that. So you definitely don't want just a thousand open files if you have, um, if you have MySQL because, you know, if you have 10 users using 100 tables, that's 1,000 open files right there. And if your limit's 1024, you're going to run out of files, open file note, um, open inodes pretty quickly. So you want it to be able to do that. And so uh, MySQL does that really well, where for security purposes, the server itself runs as MySQL. So if someone does manage to hack into MySQL, they don't have root on your server. The MySQL server files and logs are also pretty locked down as the MySQL user. So that's pretty good. If you're not in the MySQL user group, you won't be able to see these. Uh, passwords on command line. If you, you can actually, when you log into MySQL on uh, command line, you usually type like MySQL-U username-P, and you can either say dash P and then type in your password. It'll say enter your password and it's it, type in your password. Or you can do it on command line if you don't want an interactive password. So that's not so great, you might say, doing it on command line. It's stored in your bash history file then, or whatever your shell history is. Um, and then also, you might say, well, what happens if you do a process list? Can someone see the password? And the, the answer is actually no. If you type in like mysql-ushiri-p password, um, if you, somebody else, anyone, or you type a PS, what you'll see is mysql-ushiri-p xxxx. So it's pretty cool. And it's not even, it's just the same number of X's, I think it's five. It's not even like one X per actual character in the password, so they don't know how long it is. Um, and the other thing that I'd recommend is have some policies. You may not always use them or follow them, but you should have policies in a runbook so that if somebody does, if there is a breach or something, you can say, okay, well, this went against the runbook or this went against the policies. You'll always have exceptions. Somebody's like, well, what happens if you need to like make a user in an emergency? And I'm like, well, that's what emergencies are, right? You don't follow the policies in emergency. That's why it's an emergency. Um, but I do recommend having um, ideas. What happens when someone leaves the company? Do you change the database passwords? When was the last time you guys changed your database application password? Probably not since the first developer created it. Right? Maybe you should change it more often. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a little scared to change the password on my, uh, on my application user because you know, it's not just the application in that configuration file. There might be cron scripts somewhere. So it's a little tricky of an issue. You know, it's easy for me to stand here and say, change everything when somebody leaves. Your DBA leaves, you should change everything. But um, I know it's a lot harder in practice to actually do that. So authenticating to MySQL. Um, I said this is beyond the ACLs, but there are ACLs in MySQL, and you can do that. Um, you want to make sure that, that you lock down who can authenticate. Um, where do you have configuration files? Right? Somehow your application needs to talk to your database, right? And so somehow within your application, there's a configuration file that says, here's the host, here's the username, here's the password. What about encrypting that? Anyone do that? Right? What happens if someone breaks into your application? They find your config file. Boom, they can connect to your database. Right, right. Or even if they're not in your web root or your application's root or whatever, if they end up breaking into the application itself, right, like they might not be in Apache's web root, but if somebody breaks into the machine by, com by coming through Apache and they have root on the machine, they can see it even if it's not in the web directory. 
Um, and in fact, usually config files are not in the web root, so they're not visible by the web, unless you're using like Drupal or something. And then they still recommend that you chmod it so that you can't see it from the web. But if someone breaks into the web server, they can still see it. Um, that is a good point. So the, the, the point was, that doesn't seem like a solvable problem, right? Because, because somehow the application has to read it. Um, there's actually a company out there called Gazang, G-A-Z-Z-A-N-G, that does um, file system encryption with, a way, with ways for things like the application to know the key. But without storing the key in the application, I mean, it is one of these hard problems. Um, they use uh, open source encryption libraries, so they're not trying to reinvent encryption. They're just putting stuff on top of it um, to kind of wrap it around and make it as, as like an encrypted file system. Just like um, my laptop actually has an encrypted file system. So if someone steals my laptop, even if they can like guess my password to get into it, um, it's going to be an encrypted file system. So the application, the key. The application does need the key, right. There, there is... Again, it's locks on the door on your car doors, even though somebody could break a window. There, you can always break a window, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't put the locks in, right? Um, so, you know, there's there's always a way to do it, right? You talk about like ACLs and well, but people can spoof host names. Well, sure they can, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. You know, people can break your window. That doesn't mean you shouldn't lock your door. Um, and then also with securing your your application, we'll talk about SQL injection. That's one of the things that uh, that we're definitely going to talk about. But it's it's certainly something that you know people. People would say on this slide, hey, what about SQL injection? So I'm putting it here. We're going to talk more about that later. So who has ac access? Um, Percona has a toolkit called Percona Toolkit. And everything in the, in the Percona Toolkit starts with PT. That's why it says there. So there's this tool called PT Show Grants. It's free. Um, and basically what it does is it will show you grant statements. So if you log in as any user, you can type Show Grants. And it will show you the grant statement that you can then copy and paste to, say, another machine to give you the same privileges on that machine. So, you know, grant all on star.star .star to root at localhost identified by, you know, hash password. So, who has access? You can see who has access uh, with PT Show Grants. You'll get all the grant statements. Um, that just shows you all the grants. So, if you have 100 users, what are you really looking for to try to secure it if you're not going through every single one painstakingly? Well, I have two, two queries here. There's three bullet points, but it's select user host password SSL type from MySQL user. The first where clause that I would recommend doing is where super priv equals y. Now, where super priv equals y is very important. Why? Because the super privilege, it's not just, oh, well, they can read and write and do everything. What the super privilege gives you on top of all that kind of stuff is, um, well, you have the ability to shut down MySQL with the MySQL admin shutdown command. So you don't just want like someone who can say break into your application to have super privileges. Whoever has a super privilege should be a very limited set of users and it should only be your DBAs. Um, I would actually go so far as to say your application users should definitely be able to like insert and delete and read, you know, read and write. But should they be able to create a database or drop a database? Probably not. How often in your application are you creating a database? You might even say, well, they shouldn't be able to do any creates or drops tables. Right? Because aren't they only using tables? Some people might say, OK, they can create only temporary tables, because they might need to create a temporary table. Um, but I would say start with the, with the most limited uh, access, and then if you need to open it up, do that. So we're super privileged equals Y. So not just shut down. Um, that's, that's the uh, least innocuous of the things they can do with super privilege. Um, there's a flag in MySQL called read underscore only. And the idea is, if you have like a master and a slave, and you want a reads to come from the slave, you can set the slave to be read only as yes, so that nobody can write to it. Now, with the super privilege, you can write to it. And there's no warnings, there's nothing. It's silent. You would have no idea if you log in as like the super user, um, or a user with the super privilege, I should say, um, then you can write or write to a database that's read-only, and you don't even get a warning that says, hey, by the way, you're writing to a read-only database. If you are not a super user and you try to write to a read-only database, you will get an error. Um, but this is another thing that's bad that you could do if you have the super privilege, and you might not even realize it. Um, there's, but wait, there's more. Um, if, if you reach max connections, so there's, a, there's a, a variable in MySQL called max connections, and after you reach this many connections, you can't do more. Now, why is this in place? Well, every connection can use memory. Um, and there are some per thread memory buffins, per connection memory buffers. And what that 
what the reason that you have max connections is so that if you have a million threads each using a gig of memory, you won't crash MySQL because if MySQL tries to allocate more memory than exists, it'll crash. So the idea is not to crash MySQL. The problem is it's really hard to calculate what the best amount of max memory is because it's very unlikely that all of your threads that are connected are going to be using the maximum possible per thread buffers that they can get because there's more than one per thread buffer. So it's really hard to calculate it because if you just calculate it so that no matter what, MySQL would never crash, you'd have like five connections. Um, the default is, I think, 151, which is one more than Apache's um, default of 150 of max web clients. Um, they, they actually changed it. It used to be 100, and they changed it to 150. And I'm like, what's the point? Like, you, you want to change it to like 2,000 or something. You know, usually in, in heavy applications, you want to change it to, to, to be higher. So I'm like, why did you bother changing the default from like low to low? And it was because everybody who was ever running a website was, getting, was running into this error. Um, now, um, if you reach max connections, so let's say, you hit, let's say you set max connections to 2,000 and you hit max connections, you actually have one more connection that only someone with the super privilege can use. Because imagine you have queries going haywire, right? You don't want to have to shut down MySQL just to start it up again and have more queries going haywire. It's an endless loop. You want to be able to log in, figure out what's going on, whatever. MySQL gives you that with the super privilege. So make sure that the only people who have the super privilege are the people who actually need it, because they can do a lot of things. They can shut down MySQL. They can write to a read-only database. They can connect with max connections. They can do that. Now, a note here on super privilege. When MySQL starts up, when you first install MySQL, it does, in fact, give you root users. It gives you root at localhost. If you use 5.5, um, which is the current GA, it's been GA for like a year and a half, it does give you IPv6 addresses. Um, if you, uh, if you, when you start it up, it does give you a root user. The username is named root, but there's nothing special about that. You can drop that user. There's no consequences. You probably want to make sure you have at least one user that has a super privilege. Um, but if you really want to create a user called super or Shiri or DBA or whatever you want, you can drop the root user, and there's no problems with it. Um, if they have the super privilege, if you do grant all on star.star .star, star, um, to a user, it's the same as root. So there's, there's nothing special about the name root. Now, I talked about when MySQL, uh, when you first install MySQL, it gives you, you know, root at localhost. It also gives you what's called the anonymous user. And what that is is where user equals blank. You can see the last one. So user host password SSL type for MySQL user, where user equals blank. Now, by default, all of the passwords in MySQL are empty, which means you can connect from root at localhost with no password. That's nice. You should probably change that for security purposes. Um, but, you know, for security purposes, it's a whole lot better than just having something like, oh, the, the password by default is admin. I mean, it doesn't matter what your default password is because everyone's going to know it. You know, every hacker out there is going to know it anyway. So uh, I guess they decided to just leave it blank because, you know, then you know that you look at it, you could see where, you can even do where password equals blank and see that. Um, it would be very easy to see that as opposed to if you see a hashed password, you might not realize, oh, it's the default admin password as opposed to something else. So where user equals blank, well, that doesn't mean the username is the empty string. It means the username is anything. So you can connect as, say, the user Shiri, or the user John, or the user Kumar. It doesn't matter. Whoever you connect as, with that password, you can do that. Now, by default, the user, the blank user, the anonymous user, has what I will call, quote unquote, no privileges. And when I say no privileges, if you did a show grants, it would say grant usage on star.star. .star. So you might say, well, it's just usage. They can log in and that's it. Or grant usage on a database. They, they can't really, they can't read any tables. They can't write any tables. What could they do? Hold that question. We'll get back to it later because they can do stuff. But for now, I'll just say there are, quote, unquote, no permissions that that user has. Other than, by the way, being able to log into MySQL and taking up one of your TCP connections. Do you guys know how many TCP connections Linux allows you by default? Anyone want to take a guess? 12,000, 12, you said? 4,000? It's higher. Higher than that. It's 10,240, which now that I say that number, that makes sense, right? It's a 1024 times 10. Um, by default, Linux gives you 10,240 TCP connections. And I know this because I was testing out 
a MySQL solution for people who are like, okay, let's load test this baby. We're gonna have millions of simultaneous connections. Let's do it. And every time we got to about 10,000 connections, MySQL would, would break. And I'm like, well, max connections set to like 100,000. So it's not max connections. And as we figured it out, it was the TCP, the kernel was only allowing 10,240 TCP connections. So someone can denial of service attack you, even with a, an anonymous user if they're allowed from anywhere, right? If they can, they can take one of those TCP connections. All you need is about 10,000 of those if you haven't changed your kernel, and people can denial of service attack you. So that's another reason to have your database behind a firewall, is just, just that basic denial of service attack. Um, anyone can do it with, with uh, load testing software. I know, if we had more people that used load testing software though, the world would be a better place. Not the hacking part, but the, the actual load testing. So why do I say user host password SSL type for MySQL user? I didn't explain that. User and host is what makes a unique user in MySQL. This is very important because that means that Shiri at localhost and Shiri at 127.0.0.1 are technically different users. They can have different passwords. You can give them different um, permissions. I wouldn't recommend doing that. In fact, I, I just ran into a problem at Mozilla. We, we uh, moved data centers. And uh, I had a problem where I was copying some users. And so, you know, I copied a user. And uh, I had apparently copied the wrong password because I had copied the user that was from the old data center and I put it in the new one. But I didn't realize that we had a third data center. They were using a user from that data center. So when they moved everything over to the new data center, um, things didn't work because the old password is different. Now what happened was they changed the password, they changed it in the new data center only, not the old data center. But nobody was using the database in the old data center. So nobody thought to drop the user. So I, there was actually a user with the same permissions but two different passwords because the host was different. So it's just something to note that you can kind of screw yourself over if you do that. Make sure when you have the same username, you know, whether it's Shiri or Nagios or something like that or the application user, Make sure they have the same password. And that's one of the reasons to see select user host password. You can make sure that the same um, users have the same password hashes. Um, by the way, MySQL does not salt their password hashes. Um, it does salt when it's authenticating. So it does send a salted hash when it's authenticating, but stored in the database, it's not a hashed, uh, it's not a salted hash. So let's see, um, an SSL type, if SSL type is blank, it means that SSL is not required, but you can use it. Um, there's also, I think, require, which, or it might be yes. I forget what the exact uh, string is. Um, but there's, if it's required to use SSL, you can see that too. So if you wanted to check, like, hey, is everyone using SSL that's not localhost, you can write a query to do that. Um, the other reason to show password, um, if you want to do something like select user host password for mysql.user and show all the users, you can see if people have the same password hash. So if someone's using the same password for all the users, kind of defeats the purpose. Now, where is the access from? I talked about user at host being, um, being uh, uh, unique. So um, MySQL uses, in the host, it uses uh, SQL wildcards, which is percent for a multi-character uh, multi wildcard or underscore for a one-card wildcard. So hey, hello. Did the lamp just die? Yeah, the whole thing died? It went to sleep, but I'm doing things. Thank you. So um, I'll just talk about it. So the first bullet point was the percent. Percent means, uh, you know, if you have Shiri at percent, that means from any host that can reach it, it's allowed. If you had the next bullet point was percent.company.com. So like say percent.mozilla.com. Right? That means that anyone coming from that host name. Now, host names could be spoofed, right? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't put the lock on. But you might not want to, um, you might not want to put um, host names. You might want to put uh, IP addresses. Those are a little harder to spoof. 10.0.% or 192.168.%. When we were, um, when I was doing that consulting with the, the folks in the cloud, they had to use 10.0% because they didn't know if one of their application servers would be restarted. They don't know what IP address they were going to get but they did know that it would be some time, some time, some place in the A class of 10. <laughs> That's what they knew. That's the, the best they could get it. So what can you do? 
Um, so 10.0.%. Um, usually within your company, you could do something like we, we actually have a load balancer for our database stuff, so we allow things from the load balancer. So it's like, you know, 10.8.70.% or 10.8.70.20 underscore. So it could be 200, 201, 202, 203, because it's underscores a one card wildcard. One of the interesting things about MySQL is that there's actually a five-way handshake for authentication. It's, it's actually kind of cool. So when, um, if, you, if you try to connect to MySQL with a username and password, the first thing it does is it checks your host. And it says, could this, oh, there we go, could this host at all connect to me? I don't care what your username is. I don't care what your password is. Do I even allow you from this host, anyone from this host to, to, uh, to do that? And in fact, if you try to telnet to a port from a host that's not allowed, you can't even telnet to the port. MySQL won't even let that. Um, won't even let that happen, which I found out the hard way, and, and apologies to my networking guys, where I was like, it's, it's the, the firewall's not open, I can't tell net. And they're like, well, I can netcat to it, so uh, maybe it's you. And it was. Um, so another reason to not allow from percent is that um, people could just tell net to your port. And again, they're using up a TCP connection. Um, but uh, if you get something that says host is not allowed to connect, it's because there's no uh, host that would match any of the host definitions. So I said I would not talk too much about ACLs, but this is, what, um, this is what the grant statement looks like. So grant privilege type, and you can also do on a column list. So I'm kind of showing you here. It's not just like grant all on star.star or grant all on database name.star. You can actually be pretty powerful with MySQL's um, uh, ACLs here. So you can grant privilege types on a certain column list. You can say, you know, they can read all the columns, but not like the credit card ones. They can read the name. You can say grant select on name, email address, whatever, uh, but you don't have to do anything. You can say on object type. So it could be on a table name. It could be on a database name. Um, here, MySQL uses star for wildcards, which is kind of annoying, but there you go. Um, so you can say grant all on a routine name. Um, you can use routines, store procedures, or stored functions to allow people to, to do um, things they wouldn't norm normally be able to do. For example, you could say, well, they, they're allowed to read only, and they're allowed to execute some stored procedures, and then those stored procedures are allowed to say write to certain places. So using stored procedures is a way, um, security-wise, to give people access they wouldn't ordinarily have otherwise. So you're not giving them access to write to the underlying table. You're, you're giving them access to use a particular stored procedure that does something in particular, which can be a lot safer in some ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about blowing out the levels there on the mic. Um, so you grant all these things on the object, whether it's the database or table name or both, to a user, and that's a username at a host, which we just talked about, identified by, and you can either give the password in plain text or as a hash. Um, so if, you, or if you're copying a grant, it would already be hashed for you. But if you're saying identified by, quote, password, um, then you don't use the password keyword. That's why this, uh, this password here is uh, optional. And then, by default, you can see this says none. By default, this is SSL. There's no, there's no SSL required. You can require SSL, or you can require specifically X509. So one of the things that's interesting about MySQL is that you can use SSL certificates. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different levels you can, of certificates you can use. You can say, you know what, this user has to use encryption. I don't care if the certificate they use is expired. I don't care. They just have to use encryption. Right? This isn't like, do you trust that this is your bank's website on, on, an, on an Apache web certificate? It's not about like um, SSL in that way. It's about encryption. So you can actually just say, I don't care, and that's require SSL. You can say require X509 to have an X509 certificate. Oops. You can require a specific cipher. You can require a specific issuer. So you can say, okay, this has to be signed by this certificate authority. Um, so you can, actually, you can actually give your DBAs uh, secured connections, and then if they leave the company, take away their certificate, and now they can't log into the database anymore. Now, hopefully, they won't be able to get to log into your database because they're not allowed to log into your jump host or whatever anymore. But this is just um, basically how easy it is to, I mean, you still have to make the certificates and whatnot, um, but this is exactly how easy it is to make a user be secure. And you can do this with the replication user, too. So other ACLs. Um, what about object access? We talked a little bit about stored procedures, stored routines access. Um, we talked about password policies as well. Um, so I talked about stored procedures and functions. The other thing I didn't talk about yet was views. So you can actually use a view 
which some people might call a virtual table. In MySQL, it's not actually materialized. It's not a real table. It's just a query. So you can say, you know, create view foo as select username email from table that might have more information than just the username and table. Um, it's a way to give um, a view of the table, whether it's horizontal or vertical. So you can say, uh, you can give a where clause, and you can specify, well, uh, this company can see only these three fields of this table and only when the rows match that. So it's very powerful as a security tool. Um, it's not necessarily the best in performance because um, it's, not a, it's not a separate table, but it might look like a simpler table than it really is, so people might make some queries that are a little weird. Um, but again, there's always a security performance trade-off, right? Um, so it's just figuring out what that is, and you can use um, explain in MySQL to look at the uh, explain plans, to look at the optimizer plan. Uh, what are your password policies, um, and what are your roles? So you could allow people um, to run commands. We were talked about this a little bit with store procedures. You'd say, okay, they have the role of whatever should use these store procedures to do things. You know, maybe you don't allow people to create users, but you allow them to run a store procedure that creates users. Where's the access from? Well, you know, one thing you could do is you could have access from localhost only. Maybe you have a tiny, tiny, you know, blog or something that you don't really need to have, uh, you know, high availability on your database. Have it as localhost only. You know, skip networking. You don't even open your TCP ports at all. Skip networking means you connect locally via sockets, assuming you're on Unix. If you happen to be on Windows, that's uh, shared pipes or named pipes or shared memory, I think they're called. But basically, sockets. Um, so you can go sockets only if you really want, depending on how secure you are. Again, firewall. Who can attempt to denial of service attack you? You know, even if they don't have a username, even if they don't have a password, if they can connect to your TCP, if your TCP port on 3306, they take one of your precious, precious uh, connections to TCP. So I said before that the um, anonymous user had quote unquote no privileges. So here's where the quote unquote comes in. There's a database by default called test. Okay, this is the test database. Anyone can access it, anyone. Even if they have no privileges, even if it says grant usage on, okay? And this comes default with MySQL. So one of the things that you can do with, when they say, like, to make MySQL more secure, you change the root password, you drop the anonymous user, and you drop the test database. Now, why is that such a big deal? What is somebody going to do? Well, they can stuff that, that database. They can create tables. They can drop tables. They can stuff it with data. They can start putting so much data into your tables. Well, who cares? Nobody's using that. Yeah, but the file system can get full. Your logs can get full. There's a lot of junk. They can slow down your replication by putting too much stuff in it. Um, and if MySQL, by the way, if your, if your data directory gets full, your log directory gets full, MySQL just hangs because it's waiting to be able to do that commit or it's waiting to be able to write that log. So it just sits there and hangs. It doesn't crash, doesn't do it. It just hangs, just waits. Waits until there's enough space, free space. Um, so yeah, and you know, we all have disk monitoring, so we'll find that when that happens. But um, try to prevent it before it starts. So the question is, is there a grant statement like you can give somebody, you know, you can not give permission to that? No, it's hard coded into MySQL. So literally, if you can log into MySQL, you can access this drop, insert, delete. That's why they say to drop the test database. Now the problem is it's not just the database called TEST. It's any database that starts with the letters TEST. So if you have your development server and you're like, well, this is dev underscore Firefox and this is test underscore Firefox. Everyone can see that test underscore whatever because it starts, even if it's testing, T-E-S-T-I-N-G, if it starts with the letter test and that, the letters in test, and that's, that's just hard coding. I found that one out the hard way too. It's kind of funny. And it's, it's right there in the manual, but whoever reads the manual page on the test database. But I looked at it, I'm like, people are like, why do I see this random data? Why do the Thunderbird people see the Firefox database? I'm like, I don't know. And then I looked it up, and I'm like, oh, that's why. Is it case sensitive? Ah, case sensitivity with MySQL databases. So MySQL does things in a very um, simple way. A, a database in MySQL is just a directory. So if your operating system is case sensitive, like Unix is, um, then indeed it will be case sensitive. As for the test database, I, you know I haven't tried it, but that's actually a great question. Let me write that down. Um, I think the answer to is be on the safe side and just don't do it. 
but that's great. You know, this is probably the eighth time I've given this presentation in two months. So it's a current one, but I've given a lot. Nobody's asked that. It's a great question. Is test DB grants case sensitive? Like, is it, is it capital T-E-S-T -E also? There's an easy way to figure that out, right? Just create the database, create a user that isn't allowed to see anything and see what happens. That's actually one of the things I love about MySQL is that it's so easy to test these things out. Anyway, so what, what else can you do with ACLs? So there's a parameter in MySQL called local infile. Now, by default, local infile is set to one, which means you are allowed to use a, a file local to your client to import data, right? So load data, in file, whatever if you have the permissions to write to the database and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's great. That means I can connect from my laptop to a system and you know, load a file from my system, right? I'm a developer, I wanna load some data in, it's a new system or something. Well, that's bad because it allows anyone who can log into the database to take a file local to their system. So one of the security parameters in MySQL is you can set local in file to zero, which means you can't use a local in file, you have to use something that's on the database server itself. Now. This opens up another can of worms, and people have asked, but if you allow the developer to copy a file to the MySQL database server, to somewhere the MySQL server can see it, like temp or something, um, isn't that like bad for security, because now you're giving a developer a login to a machine? It's like, well, that's your trade-off, right? Your trade-off is, do you want to allow people to import locally, or if they want to import something, it has to be on the server? And you know, it may be something like in development, they they can import locally, and in production, they can't. Um, skip symbolic links. This is uh, one of those things that uh, maybe was a problem 50 years ago. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, in MySQL, it's actually pretty cool. If you can actually um, symbolically link directories or files, and MySQL will actually follow them, which is great when you're like running out of disk space, and you're like, well, let me move this file over to another directory and quickly do a symbolic link to it if, if nobody notices that it moved, and, it, and it'll work. So I've done that when I'm like running out of disk space and move a file over, it works. Um, and apparently, it, this is flagged as one of these security options to skip that. I've never, really, seriously? I've never heard of someone who had any problems where someone like broke into their computer and uh, you know, broke into their MySQL and changed their data directory to like symbolically link somewhere else. I've, you know, I think it's more of a problem of um, someone stealing your data than someone kind of making your data be, look different, but um, it's something that you can do. So is this coming back up? I don't know what's wrong with this baby. Oh, that's the lens cap. Come on, baby. Yeah, but I'm changing it. Maybe the blue is uh, not changing enough. Anyway, um, so the last three things on that slide, maybe while this comes up, was to grant max queries per hour, max updates per hour, and max connections per hour. And that's part of the grant statement. At the end of the grant statement, that I, the big long one I showed you before, you can actually say, grant, you know, all on start, at start, a year yet, whatever, max queries per hour equals whatever. By default, it's zero, which means unlimited. Um, but you can say max queries per hour 10. That user can only do 10 queries per hour. Any queries, whether it's select, show, whatever it is. Um, max updates per hour is the same, but for updates. Well, it's blue. It's coming. Up. Oh, I don't want to power off. I won't, I won't push power again. Um, so uh, yeah, it's coming back slowly. So uh, that updates are any writes. So inserts, updates, deletes. So you can say as many selects as you want, as many reads as you want. You want to type show databases, whatever you want. But the max updates per hour is 100. Or max connections per hour. They can only have this many times they connect per hour, um, which is great. Um, and that's actually pretty cool and pretty powerful. The problem is you only get these three, and you only get them max per hour. You can't say per minute or per day. You can only say per hour. and it's. Um, it's not time-based, it's not like in the 6 o'clock hour. It's like if your first login is at 6, 12 p.m., then you have 100 more logins, you know, connections or whatever to there. So I don't know too many people who use this, but if it's something that you're concerned about, you could use that. Changing ACLs. Again, this is one of these, like, what's your policy? Who changes them? Your DBA? Who, who's auditing your DBA? Um, how are those changes audited, and when do they happen? 
Do they happen when a developer who's been working on the project leaves? Right? Like, you know, I, I say this, and as I was writing these slides, it's like, it's like nobody does this. Like, I've never worked for a company that's like, oh, this developer left, and he was like the head of the project, so we got to change our database passwords. Nobody ever says that. But like, from a security standpoint, that's the first thing you should change. Um, so I'm a little passionate about that, as you can tell. Um, but it's just one of those things that nobody does, but, but nobody would argue. Like, this would totally not be PCI compliant, or HIPAA compliant, or any compliance. HIPAA probably doesn't matter, but it wouldn't be PCI compliant to say, oh, when someone leaves, no, we don't change our database passwords, right? And for me, by the way, people are like, well, can you explain what PCI compliance is? Because it's not really security. For me, PCI compliance is basically, did you do your due diligence enough so that the journalist writing the story is going to make you sound like you did your due diligence? Or is the journalist going to make you sound like, right? Because you could have like a homegrown load balancer, traffic shaper that is way more secure than, say, a Juniper router, right? But the Juniper router is PCI compliant, and the homegrown one isn't. Why? Because basically, well, if some journalist comes and says, oh, yeah, they did their own, um, that's going to look like, well, yeah, of course, it was a two-bit hack. So of course, your system got hacked. You did your own. You didn't go with the, the you know, you didn't go with Juniper. Um, so anyway, so when do they happen? Um, when do they change? Secure Itch is actually a really good program. You can look it up. It does, um, it uses stored procedures in a database. And it has its own table. So it's basically a collection of store procedures. It's written by Darren Kasser. It's a free and open source. He's a community member in MySQL. And it basically allows you to have roles. So for example, this has a, uh, an example of a role of select. And then you basically apply that role to a person and an object. So this bottom command here, call grant privilege, is giving the role one, which could have been named better, the select role to john at machine.domain.com on the employee's database. So that's actually a very powerful tool for security, um, and it's very neat. So some of the things you can do that you can't do in MySQL, you can have reserved usernames. So you can say, well, nobody's allowed to have the username of root or super. Um, you can block users. So something you can't do in MySQL is to just disable a user. If they're in the MySQL grant table, they have permissions. Right? So if you have, like, say, a contractor that comes in once a quarter to do some work for a month, you would have to create the user, then drop the user, then create the user, then drop the user. This set of store procedures does that for you. Um, it stores the credentials while it's disabled. It deletes it from the MySQL table for you and stores it in its own table so that you can then say, OK, wait, turn this account on again. Something you can't do with MySQL, which would be very useful. Renaming a user. If you try to rename a user in MySQL, it resets the privileges to be nothing. Ask me how I know. I'm so glad you asked me how I know. We just did this data center move. And so I was like, oh, just update everything that was like 10.2 to 10.8. Guess what? <laughs> it worked, and they could connect, and that's all they could do because we dropped the test database, so they couldn't do anything else. You can also clone a user. You can say, make a user like Shiri, name, name it John. And then you can also do reconciliation. What's reconciliation? Well, like I said, Securich has its own table of usernames and passwords. So what happens when um, somebody grants something not using Securich? Well, that's not in Securich's stuff. So you can reconcile, and you can say, make sure that you're up to date with the MySQL table. And there's um, robust ways of reconciling. You could say, oh, overwrite with mine, or have it overwrite mine. Server options, bind address. So by default, MySQL will listen on TCP port 3306 on all of the IP addresses on your machine, whether it's 127.0.1 or if you have 70 different IP addresses. You can use dash dash bind address to give it a comma-separated list of, of IPs or host names to listen on. So you might say, well, we have uh, support.mozilla.com and addons.mozilla.com, but we only want it to listen on support.mozilla.com, that IP address. You can do that. Skip name resolve. So I was talking about the five-way handshake that MySQL has. And um, one of the things that MySQL will do is if you connect by a host name, like you say MySQL-u, uh, you know, foo.mozilla.com, it will actually look up that, um, that, IP that uh, host name to get the IP address. Well, if DNS is horked, then uh, you can't connect to MySQL <laughs> because it's waiting and waiting and waiting. Like if there's a lag in DNS, then that's a problem. The good news is that will never happen because there's never any problems with DNS. Um, the bad news is that's tr that that's not true. And uh, so a lot of people use skip name resolve. The thing is if you use skip name resolve, when you have your grants to user at host, that host has to be an IP address. Now when I say has to be, 
What I mean is, you can certainly, MySQL will allow you to put in host names, they just won't use them. And if you restart MySQL, you'll notice in your error logs it says, um, warning, I can't use this, so I'm just not going to bother. Skip show database by default. If you do, you can allow people, there's a grant called show database that you can allow people to see databases they're not in, and by default you can do that. So we already talked about how does your data flow, where is your data encrypted? Um, is it encrypted in the database itself? Do you say insert into foo um, MD5 of the password? Well, the logs will now have a statement that has a password in plain text. Do you encrypt it in your um, code? So you're basically saying insert into you know, the table, it's already encrypted. Well, where along lines do you encrypt it? The closer you encrypt it to where the client types it in, the better, right? Because if somebody, again, it's about stealing meaningful data versus stealing data. Uh, where do the errors go? Are, are you checking your error logs to make sure that you're getting everything? And where does the traffic flow? We talked about replication, backups. Think about everything. Separating administrative apps. Um, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to go through this a little quickly. Uh, same data, different interface. Um, it prevents, basically, denial of service attacks from your reporting people. Um, and then you, you, you can, um, it's usually for performance, but you might want to have it for administrative apps, too. That way, if someone, like, breaks into your app server, they'd have to break into your admin app server to get the admin privileges. Uh, plain text information, don't store it if you don't have to. Um, I mean, don't store if you don't have to, period. But definitely don't store plain text information. Salt your passwords. Um, so if you see this password hash, the one on top, that's the password hash of password. Can anyone guess what this bottom one is? No, actually, it's not. No, you, you probably won't guess it. But it is a common word. So if I do this and I do star, the cool part is the first one that comes up is uh, this, uh, <laughs> this, this presentation. The second one is, oh, look, an open hash database. Let's check it out. What's this? It's a rainbow table. You have MD5 sum, MD5 of MD5. So don't get clever. Don't think, oh, well, I'll MD5 my MD5 sum, and that'll be secure. No. Uh, and here's a MySQL password and then SHA-1 as well. So here's a whole table. And look here. And oh, look, penguin. So it's the name penguin, which I should have guessed because uh, this is something I actually did because there was a username was penguin, and I was trying to figure out what the password was. So this is called Google hacking, by the way. Um, if you do it for good, it's called white hat Google hacking. And let's see, what else is there? Uh, SQL injection. Um, you all know little bobby tables, right? All right, good. That's what database injection is. That's what uh, SQL injection is. And you might say, well, does that really happen? Um, just last month, I was giving this presentation. Someone came up to me afterwards and said, have you tried this? Do a curl-head of reddit.com. So this just gets the, the headers from Reddit. OK, you've got HTTP 1 OK, content type. It sets a cookie, big deal. Um, and then the server name is quote semicolon drop server table server type. So I'm guessing somewhere that there's like hacker software out there that will go and find the server types and puts it in a database called, or a table called server types. And then you can see that's when I ran this. So how cool is it? This is like a real world there. And you can, you can curl reddit.com. It's been there for like three, four years. Uh, escaping user input, so again, trying to avoid SQL injection. There are libraries that will do this for you. Um, but look, be on the lookout for things like semicolon that starts a new statement, things like that. Um, not only does, is it good for you know, not having SQL injection, but it saves yourself time if you validate email addresses, for example. You don't have to do that when you, um, when you uh, go to email somebody. Uh, prepared statements, you can use those, but they're not very efficient. Uh, trusting get or post, I hope you're not necessarily trusting it because people have been um, stealing sessions, cross-site request forgery. I have two whole minutes. I thought I had less than that. Um, stored code, so I talked about stored procedures or functions, and I talked about views. MySQL also has events. Now, who here is running a cron script um, to do database stuff, right? Maybe you're doing a cache table, whatever. Um, well, if you're doing something like uh, every five minutes run something to clean out a table or you know, cache sessions, or every day you're cleaning out a table, you can actually use a MySQL event. And what that is is it's, a, it's, a, it's basically like a procedure, a store procedure in MySQL, but it's run via a scheduler in MySQL. And it's just as powerful as at or cron. You can say run it every 10 minutes or run it at a certain time. Um, and you could say repeat it, repeat it until this day. You could say repeat you know, every day until Saturday, or you could say repeat every day for the rest of your life doing this. Um, 
And the cool part is because it's already in MySQL, you basically, when you define it, you say invoke it as this person, as this user, and you don't have to put in a password. It just runs in the MySQL scheduler. The other benefit is that it's backed up with MySQL. So if you ever had the problem where you're like, you made a new server and you're like, oh, we forgot the cron scripts, you don't have to worry about that with events. Auditing and monitoring, prevention's only one part of security. Um, MySQL has auditing um, plugins. It has a plugin uh, API, excuse me. And McAfee's actually released an open source um, tool. They released it a couple months ago. I haven't had a chance to assess it yet. Um, but you know, it's McAfee, it's probably pretty decent. Um, and then monitoring, how do you alert for your security issues? That's not a solved problem yet. You can use the general log to see all login attempts. Um, and there's actually a, a variable called max connect errors, which I will um, talk about very quickly. It's a global thing, and by default it's 10, which means you can try to connect and fail 10 times before your account's locked. That's pretty cool, 10 times in a row. If you, if you try three times and then you log in successfully, the counter's reset. So that's by default is 10. It's a pretty good default, because you've probably never heard of it before. The problem with this is, let's say two people are locked. Shiri and John are locked. Um, but the way that you unlock is by doing a flush hosts. You can't just unlock one person. It's global. And you can't just say, well, Shiri's allowed to connect 10 times, but John's allowed to connect only three times before he gets locked out. So the problem is that it's global to lock and global to unlock. Um, so my final advice to you is play hard to get. Um, use MySQL events instead of cron task scheduler. If there's no password saved, there's no password to steal. Um, again, no plain text passwords or credit cards or whatever. If they, if they grab your database and they have no information in it, then they have no information. So don't store it if they don't need it. There's also an authentication plugin, so you can use um, Windows or PAM authentication. So you can use LDAP, which is awesome. Um, creating policies, make sure you do it, and that's it. Well, yeah, LDAP isn't awesome if, if uh, DNS isn't as awesome. And uh, right now, it's a little hacky. Like, you basically use a proxy user. So you basically say, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can't say, oh, anyone in this group can now use the root account. So it's still in its infancy. But it's something that people have been wanting for a long time. So, you know, again, how is LDAP good for anything? And yet, that's if DNS isn't good. And yet, that's what people use universally. So. That's, uh, I don't think that's, uh, and by the way, I don't work for Oracle slash MySQL, I work for Mozilla, so um, find me in the hallways, ask me anything, whatever you want, I will, uh, I will let you know, but just, I'm not, uh, I only drink certain Kool-Aids, so. Thank you guys so much. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk 
allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.